Andrew, hello, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Hi Andy, how are you getting on? Yeah, I'm good too, thank you very much. Um, it's been a real thrill um, making these videos. I've been hearing from fascinating people, but I am definitely um, uh, more excited by this particular video uh, than I think I have been by any other. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so much. Cheers to you. Um, we are, mm, that is delicious. We are um, beginning our videos by asking our contributors very soberly to introduce themselves and give us an overview of their work. So would you mind doing that, please? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, might as well get it in soberly before anything else. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, my name is uh, Andrew Smith um, and uh, I'm based at the University of Chichester. Um, I'm a, a, a French historian, um, historian of modern France, um, and I do a lot of work. Uh, my first book was on the wine growers of the Languedoc, hence our um, uh, uh, rather useful props um, that we've, we've brought along today. Um, and what I'm currently wo working on as well is uh, the um, uh, the Larzac affair in France, um, which is, uh, of course, why I think we have one of the other props, which I've encouraged you to bring along, Andy, um, which is some uh, delightful, uh, should, should we wait until you can display it on camera? I can display mine at the same time. I feel time. like I should give like a vegan trigger warning at this point. But oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some Roquefort cheese. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, the current project I'm working on deals with the uh, 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 kind of um, sheep herds of the um, sheep farmers of the the, the Larzac plateau. And um, so, like, what does my work look at? Um, looks really a lot of it is about ideas of uh, identity um, and the state, um, things like mm -hmm. subnational identities. I like looking at professional identities, um, quite into ideas of like resistance. Uh, and looking at things, well, clearly food and wine has played into it a lot. Um, and yeah, there's, there's kind of uh, those kind of ideas, um, kind of identity, resistance, um, ways that people kind of justify themselves out with that relationship to the state um, and ways in which they actually practice their identity and live the kind of uh, the world around them um, is, is what really interests me. Thank you. And just for people who won't have heard that term before, could you unpack for us the idea of sub subnational identities? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's actually something that kind of started really when I was a kid. Um, as you can probably tell, uh, I am currently resident in the, uh, the south of England, but uh, I'm not uh, naturalised here, as it were, um, from my accent. Um, growing up, I was always a bit confused because you used to ask my uh, mom and dad when you'd see things that talked about countries. And I would see things on the news that said like something about the United Kingdom or Great Britain um, or Scotland. And I said, well, you know, is the United Kingdom a country? And they say, yes. And they say, is Scotland a country? And they say, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, how are they both countries? And then, then and mom well, and dad were then at that point trying to find something else to do, maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> throw a packet of sweeties at me or something. But uh, the idea I thought I found um, was something that always kind of puzzled me. Um, now, beyond getting over the rather simple kind of categorization of the fact that, you know, the United Kingdom is composed of the four nations. Um, I got past that hurdle fairly early on. Um, but what I became really interested in is the way that people kind of express their own identity and what it means to be from, um, from a certain place. So um, in that, what I mean by uh, subnational identity, uh, minority national identity, regional identity, these are all terms you see chucked around in the literature, um, is a, really a kind of affiliation with a kind of national unit beneath that or spilling beyond that of the nation state. Uh, so for most people, you might think of uh, Scots, Irish, Welsh, um, you might think of uh, Catalan, Breton. Um, it kind of depends where you kind of fit within these, uh, these different structures. It of course moves about all over the place. We've got different examples from different places. Um, I tend to focus on Western Europe, in particular France um, and around France. And also a little bit, um, some of my work as well, I didn't mention earlier on, uh, looks at the end of empire in French West Africa. Because again, I'm really interested in that kind of moment, um, especially in West Africa, where kind of in the 19, towards the end of the Second World War, to kind of uh, mid 1960s, you've got this end of formal empire and the kind of the launch of all these kind of newly independent nation states. 
but most of these nation states follow colonial boundaries. So they don't sort of exist, as it were. They're things which are kind of created. Um, and so with that idea of seeing how people kind of create nations, create identities, it's a wonderful way to kind of look at the expression of identity and how that relates to kind of uh, meaning and all the rest of it. Um, I did a little article on that about a guy called Keita Fodeva, um, who's a musician and, um, and poet. Uh, and that's just, yeah, it's a really fun kind of thing to look at, I think, and to understand. Because, you know, we all have national identities um, and they all mean different things. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, uh, it kind of connotes all these different ideas. So, yeah, these ideas, subnational identities, that's where I get all that from. Uh, that's where it's come from for me, I think. Uh, anyway, Thank you. And you, you've already tantalizingly linked those issues too if I've understood you rightly, uh, grapes, sheep, and now music and poetry. <laughs> That's the one, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, do, I do quite like it. Um, I got my, uh, um, got my daughter into uh, the music of this guy, Keita Fodeba, um, when she was very young, because when I was writing the article, I got a couple of vinyls. Um, and so when she was kind of, she's three now, but um, when she was kind of really a baby, I put these vinyls up, um, these vinyls on, and as soon as she was kind of standing up about one, she started to kind of like demand the vinyl. Whenever she wanted music, she'd ask to put that on, you know? Um, so I'll send you on some links so you can listen to, to some of the music, but it's fantastic. Um, and this guy's really interesting because uh, when somebody like Franz Fanon talks about uh, national culture, when he talks about ideas, he quotes really heavily from uh, Fodeva's work um, and... Uh, there's a really interesting kind of uh, poetic uh, element to it. Um, he's got this uh, poem called, and the name of a collection called Aube Africain, African Dawn. Um, and part of the, the kind of the vignette that opens that article is the fact that um, there's an edition published before independence and after independence. And in the middle, there's five words added. Because um, at the start, he says, you know, it was the dawn and then the dawn of African freedom um, and it becomes this kind of way of you know re rewriting the certainty of independence um, so yeah that's that's the music angle but yeah sorry I'm, I'm wat um, you know wittering on again but yes otherwise uh, wine and cheese as well uh, so wine cheese and music um, it's uh, a decent collection so far <laughs> yeah and I can see how in the course of um not just writing poetry, but publishing it several times at different historical moments, mm. how you could rewrite national identity. How, how does that map onto the wine and cheese industry? Or how do those questions yeah, sure. map onto it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we are both drinking. Should we introduce the wines we're drinking? Uh, and then we can get a sense of it. So, um, so I, I've got a, a, a Corbière, uh, just right here. Um, I don't know how the camera will see it. Uh, drinking a, a Corbière here. Um, and what are you drinking, Andy? Uh, I am drinking, do I say Minervois? So listen, I'm not yeah, very so good on wine at all, but uh, I'm drinking okay. wine. Uh, <laughs> this one. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, so you've got Minervois, I've got uh, uh, Corbière. Um, the kind of, you see them coming from cooperatives a lot of the time. These are based right down the south of France um, in the uh, in the Languedoc, um, uh, which is now a region that has been recently renamed. The amalgamated region is called Occitanie, um, and the name of that region gives you a clue as to why it's a bit different. If you're looking at a map, it's like that bit of France where it joins onto Spain. Um, we're kind of talking about this little area here. Um, so my wines are from about here, and yours are from about here. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, the name of the region, Occitanie, um, gives you a clue as to what that difference is. Um, same as the word, uh, uh, the place named Languedoc. Um, Languedoc is the language of Oc, um, as opposed to the Languedoc. Mm. Um, French, as we know it, um, is the Languedoc, the language which has we oui as yes, um, whereas in the Languedoc, Oc is the word for yes. Oh. Um, and so uh, it is. Um, it's uh, uh, essentially, it never really was, it never was a nation state um, because it was subsumed long before nation states existed. Um, but it was an area which had its own distinct language, um, quite distinct customs, um, and was broadly geographically delimited um, in the south of France. Um, mostly around the lands loyal to the Counts of Toulouse uh, in the 12th century. Uh, now, that's kind of one of the things you get from that region. Um, it's uh, the strong defense of identity, which is based on language, which is based on culture, which is based on practice, and all these things. 
Um, essentially, it gets subsumed into the French nation state um, in a process starting with the Albigensian Crusade, which is like 12th century. Um, that's where you get the wonderful phrase at the uh, Siege of Béziers. The Albigensian Crusade is where they try to wipe out a form of heretical Christianity uh, called um, Catharism, uh, which is uh, some people... I guess a little bit kind of um, generously describe it as a Western form of Buddhism. Um, but uh, it kind of issues modern um, materialism uh, and everything's, you know, about the mind and the spirit and, you know, this is, this is the bad place. Once we die, we go to the good place. If you see what I mean, there's the kind of um, horribly bastardized simplification of, <laughs> of Catholic religion. And basically there's a crusade, um, which is largely um, a mask for Northern barons to seize Southern land. Um, and it's extraordinarily bloody. Um, and it involves besieging many of the walled cities of the South. Um, the siege of Béziers, we have the famous phrase that I mentioned, uh, because there's a query about how they'll tell who is a Cathar and who is a good Christian. Um, and the commander, whose name I forget, this precise second says, um, uh, kill them all, God knows his own. Um, which is certainly an expedient way to deal with it. <laughs> um, but yes, that largely eradicates the sort of um, state structures around an Occitan identity. Um, and it kind of becomes part of the, um, the, main, the mainstream French nation, if you know what I mean, the, the, the la plus grande France. Um, to the extent that it is today. Um, the use of Occitan as a language is quite high in at the turn of the 20th century and declines kind of precipitously thereafter. Mm. Um, big touchstones, there's a lot of poetry in Occitan um, in common with a lot of places. End of the 19th century, they kind of embark on a literary um, renaissance um, um, and this group called the Fille Brige uh, and they basically write all sorts of um, what do you say, like heraldic poetry, you know, it's all kind of, uh, oh, my dear lady, I do beseech thee and all the rest of <laughs> this kind of stuff, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's all very nice and very literary. Um, it never quite gets uh, a full political expression at the time that things like Catalanism do. Um, I tried to write an article on why that is um, with one of my friends who is a sociolinguist um, called James Hawkey. Um, based out of Bristol, and he is uh, he's a, a, a kind of specialist on Catal uh, Catalan sociolinguistics, and he does a little bit of Occitan on the side. Um, but he, uh, we tried to look at, you know, essentially, it was partially why the dog doesn't bark, why um, Catalan style kind of politicization of that culture never seems to happen in quite the same way in the Languedoc. Now, one of the reasons I'm really interested in it, really excited by it, uh, and why it's tied to wine is because in 1907 um, there is a vast like rebellion um, which starts with uh, wine growers who are essentially protesting as a result of um, uh, downturns in the wine industry, uh, then sales crises and uh, suspected fraud and kind of uh, profiteering basically by kind of middlemen. Um, they essentially stage a series of revolts every Sunday um, where it grows to up to about 600,000 people in the streets of Montpellier. Um, they cut the telegram lines to the north. Um, there's a, a, a regiment of the army, the 17th, um, defects to the side of protesters. You know, this looks like a big moment. Um, you know, the, the, the army are there killing protesters and there's, you know, places are torched and all the rest of it. And it's this weird kind of protest. It sort of fizzles out a little bit as the, the, the leader of the protest, there's two leaders, um, Marcelin Albert, who's a bearded, top-hatted uh, shopkeeper uh, from the town of Argelier, and then another guy called Ernest Ferrul, um, who is big, Kropotkin-style, bushy beard, um, <laughs> the socialist mayor of Narbonne. Um, now he's basically a communist before communist is a thing. Um, hipster communism, I think, what we call it. Um, uh, but... Yeah, they kind of bring together a kind of union between classes. And so that, that has a long legacy. And that's what a lot of my work's been about, looking at where that legacy goes, looking at why wine matters to identity, looking at how it's been politicised, looking at how in that region it's, uh, it becomes an expression of so many interesting political kind of conflicts. Because um, the first thing to say is, you know, there's a kind of a dismissal, I guess, because... You know, it's France, it's wine, it's protest. People kind of say, well, you know, that's going to happen, you know. Uh, it's slot A, tab B. 
Um, but I think one of the things I always chat about is that wine in the longer dock has historically been like shipbuilding was in, you know, in Glasgow or Newcastle. Um, it's, it, it's a huge um, kind of almost like agro industry um, at the turn of the 20th century, which is uh, all encompassing. Um, if you're not involved in the wine trade, you're involved in the tertiary industry or, you know, related like barrel making or bottling or something like that. Um, and it's a, it's a vast uh, influence at the turn of the century. So it's, it's really crucial to see this. Yeah. Um, and most of my work's about how that changes in the later 20th century. So yes, yeah, um, it's a big thing. Identity, protest, um, that minority national idea as well about Occitanism, um, the expression of something that's not French. Um, it's not Paris, it's the South. Uh, and you probably see somewhere on your wine, um, I guarantee you there'll be a um, like label from one of the marketing things that talk about Sud de France or, you know, um, idea uh, uh, Van de la Sud or something like that, you know. Um, Somewhere along the lines, but yeah, it's a kind of a kind of proud difference from the the national norm, from the kind of the centre, as it were. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I've got lots of questions. Most of them probably either really obvious, really stupid. But why why nineteen oh seven? Do you think why what why why that moment? Um, and you explain why why wine is the place from which that battle might happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Why nineteen oh seven? Uh, there's a kind of longer history to it, um, which is that uh, about 1860, um, basically the entirety of Western Europe uh, and into Central and Eastern Europe as well, um, is devastated by a, a louse, um, by a little, little wiggly louse, um, which is imported from the US, um, Phylloxera vastatrix, um, and it's uh, in the US, the vines are pretty much immune to it. Um, but as a result, uh, they make pretty horrible wine. Um, but in uh, Europe, we didn't have any resistance um, to this louse. Uh, and so um, the, the noble vine, Vitis vinifera, um, was susceptible to it. And what the, vice, the, vi the real louse does is it eats the roots of the, 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 the vines. And so basically it spread like wildfire. Um, all the kind of the old prestigious vineyards, all the kind of all the vineyards uh, suddenly were dying. Um, the wine industry was absolutely devastated. Uh, it takes a long time to figure out a solution to that. Um, and uh, you have some people who, I mean, they practice all kinds of like quack cures. Um, and one of the suggested quack cures is to have, um, to have young boys urinate on the vines because seemingly that special combination might, uh, didn't work. Um, <laughs> so the thing that actually fixes it is um, grafting vines onto different rootstock. So you take the resistant rootstock, you take the, the vine that makes the nice wine and you can have like cut it and paste it in. Ish. <laughs> um, but anyway, that uh, takes a while. The reheating of the industry, after the recovery from that process, um, down in the Languedoc, which is a beautiful area with some wonderful weather and the perfect place to grow lots of wine and very productive uh, vines, is um, essentially overheats and people go nuts planting. Um, and it becomes essentially the kind of, uh, we well, see the bread basket, don't you? We see the, the wine cellar um, of uh, France and Europe. Uh, it produces the, the bulk of, um, of French wine. Not, and I should say this, not wine for swirling in a glass, contemplating and twiddling your moustache while you enjoy it. Um, usually just wine for drinking at the dinner table, the staple rather than the star of the dinner table. Yeah. So after 1860, then there's the recovery. That recovery involves a really heavy, like almost industrialization of that, that sector mm -hmm. um, down in the long run, kind of concentration of it, um, which then leaves it, because of that over-concentration, very, very um, prone to market fluctuations, mm -hmm. um, of which it experiences many. Um, and leading up to the turn of the 19th century, uh, we have um, increasing Algerian production. Um, and a big part of the story is also about France's relationship with Algeria. Of course, prior to that, not much wine produced in Algeria because of uh, well, the fact that it's uh, you know, largely Muslim territory. Um, after French conquest in 1830, there's many more European settlers who are kind of growing vines there and all the rest of it. Although I did come across something in the special collections in uh, St Andrews, uh, which uh, talked about uh, how excellent Algerian rosé was um, before conquest, hmm. which is news to me. But um, the... Uh, 
Yeah, basically that. It's a market that gets massively overheated. There's too much wine being produced uh, of not very good quality, let's be honest. Um, they're very vulnerable to any fluctuations uh, and that produces quite extreme downturns in the market. And as a result, the kind of impoverishment of like extreme grinding impoverishment of large sections of the population. Um, there's an attempt to do something in 1905, um, but there's a kind of ideological break, shall we say. All the, uh, the kind of unions and the kind of working labour organisers um, can't get together with the landowners and say, well, we're not going to get together with those guys because they're the ones that are causing the problems. Um, what happens in 1907 is essentially a kind of much simpler message. Uh, which is that there is fraud, that the system is broken, and someone needs to fix it. Hmm. And so they kind of rally around this idea um, in 1907, which unites classes. Uh, there's a wonderful moment in uh, the National Assembly, the French Parliament, um, where a guy, I believe it's Justin Auger, who's a, um, a deputy, kind of stands up and says, you know, uh, essentially, we're sick, the region is sick, and we need you, the doctors, uh, to fix us. Of course, then people start taking a piss because one of the reasons that uh, everybody has been recommending wine is its health qualities. And of course, people then bark that and back at them. So have a glass of wine, feel better. Um, and such is the kind of contempt with which it's treated. And there's a kind of sense that people are treated with contempt. And that's one of the things that pushes that, you know. Um, it's always the reference to Paris, to them up there, to the, you know, someone that's remote, that unfeeling. Uh, and so a lot of these things come together in 1907 that pushes this towards, uh, towards a kind of... Um, Kind of, yeah, exponential protest with. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm I'm blown away by everything you told me. I was expecting maybe um, kind of war with Prussia to be at, behind some of the things happening in the 1860s. <laughs> so hearing about America, um, yeah, kind of new 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 world competition, if that's right. Um, kind of the, the crossover, whatever's bringing the lights from America. I presume is something it's something to do with it. kind of Victorian plant trading. I think um, it's about people kind of in some ways it's about kind of plant trading and sample trading, um, and it kind of enters Europe really at this. Um, I think there are multiple points of entry. I've somewhere in in the thesis and the book I've looked at this other thing that looks at it from a kind of epidemiological perspective, the entrance of um, phylloxera. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting thing. Um, there are people down south who are basically trying to get more out of their vines. And they're looking for a way to kind of innovate. You know, I want more productive vines. So those guys over there have them. So let's, you know, let's have some of that. Let's try it. Um, but then, you know, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that um, you get when people talk about uh, GM crops and all the rest of it. This is the worry, you know, you think, oh, well, we'll just try this. And then the old uh, law of unintended consequences uh, clicks into action and suddenly you're... Um, up creeks without paddles. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I guess I'm just struck by this world of um, subnational identities as you're introducing us to at the start, and identities which identify as not French suddenly finding themselves um, affected by um, by uh, American wildlife, and at the same time in competition with Algeria, with movements around wine in Algeria, um, kind of the compensate compensatory industrialization of the area then causing its own problems. Um, land ownership, all those things kind of moving together. You kind of got this very, uh, uh, both sub, but also super national, international yeah, 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 yeah. Um, levels to, to what's going on. Um, Andrew, if it's all right, is it okay then to park that and move to cheese and to think about sure. how, how many of these ideas look from the point of view of your, your um, so the, the, the wine, the wine um, project you've been talking about turned into your first book, right? Which is out. Um, and yeah. Then, Cheese is now is the next project. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I've got a copy of the book somewhere. Um, I'll wave it at you for half a second, and then I'll send you like a proper image as well. Here you go. This is the, uh, the book that. itself. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, that I would uh, now that that kind of takes that nineteen or seven story and picks it up in the nineteen sixties. Right. Um, and actually, that, that what I talked about before the end of empire is important in both these stories. Um, not just because. Uh, one of the kind of characteristics in France is you get lots of colonial administrators kind of come home, as it were, and are suddenly put in charge of the regions, the kind of the troublesome regions, uh, to sort them out because it's just peasants um, is the idea. And there's a lot of discussion about the fact that managing peasants in Senegal and Ivory Coast is no different to managing peasants in the the old uh, the Ejo or the Aveyron. Um, you know, it kind of says to these administrators, you can sort it out. Um, now, the guys that I write about in that book are the, essentially um, the Comité uh, Régional d'Action Viticole and the CRAV, um, and they're kind of wine terrorists, um, 
vague scare quotes on terrorists. Uh, but uh, that's what they're dubbed in 92. Now, they're part of the same wave. The reason that they come about is the same reason that kind of the cheese stuff kicks off at the same time. Some of that is because of the end of empire in Algeria. So lots of young guys um, have, are conscripted and have to fight in the, the war in Algeria. Um, and they come back uh, essentially brutalized by it. Um, it's not a very nice war. Uh, it involves things like um, the French army committing torture and what Emmanuel Macron acknowledges were war crimes. Um, and so a lot of people conscripted, uh, I think one in four families in France sends a son to fight in Algeria. You know, this is big stuff. Um, and uh, a lot of those young guys go across, come back to villages that are still as rubbish as when they left them. Um, and suddenly say, well, hang on, I feel more like those guys than I do like the guys that live up in Paris. And there's a kind of general reckoning that happens amongst many kind of regionalists um, around that time, which equates their experience to decolonization, the changing sovereignty of the state. So there's a kind of um, a renaissance in, uh, in, in kind of Occitan political action. Um, much of it around a group called the COEA, um, which is like the Occitan Committee of Education and Action. Um, now they're heavily involved in the wine growers, but they're also, uh, they end up supporting, for example, the, the, the things that happen around these, uh, these, these cheese makers or these kind of sheep farmers, I should say. Um, and some of that relates to actually the poster behind me. There's a, you can't quite see it out of shot. There's a big list of different organizations. They're all kind of friends together. Now these, uh, these sheep farmer, uh, sheep farmers are kind of part of that same subnational unit of Occitanie. Um, they're part of that same region. Um, they're a little bit further north uh, of Carcassonne, so um, where your wine comes from uh, is just kind of between Narbonne and Carcassonne, but just a bit north, um, and uh, a tiny bit north, um, whereas this is a good bit north, <laughs> on the Larzac steppe. Um, there's a big kind of uh, steppe in French, a uh, which is a big kind of limestone plateau. Now, uh, there's not much on that plateau. Um, and again, uh, there's a lot of sheep farming on it. One of the things there also is, since about the turn of the 20th century, is a French army base. Um, why? Because there's a lot of land. It's pretty sparsely populated. There's lots of kind of space, so you can drive your tanks around, you can shoot stuff, you can you know, do all that stuff that soldier, so, soldiers do. Um, the difficulty is, um, and that, that camp is used as a detention center during the Algerian war for, um, for prisoners of war, for example. So it's, it's again linked to the Algerian war. Now, um, in running in the years up to 1970 um, and in 1970 itself, there is an announcement that the army base is going to be expanded. They're going to treble it in size. Um, and the, uh, essentially it's just announced. Um, and so there's some discussions about it. Uh, Michel Dupré kind of says, well, what can you do? Um, the only people that live there are some, uh, uh, you know, some farmers and some sheep. They don't really do much. You know, it's basically a desert. Um, this phrase, it's basically a desert, is constantly used. Hmm. There's this kind of uh, this slang thing they use, which say, like, even the crows take a backpack to cross the Larzac. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, there's nothing. <laughs> it's just this vast expanse. It's a weird place as well. There's all these, like... Um, like limestone kind of, I don't, I'm not a geologist, but like the like rocky outcrops, these are big like standing stone type things. It's kind of eerie and wonderful and beautiful and all the rest of it. Um, but lots of sheep, very isolated. Um, so beautiful weather in summer, kind of wild in, uh, in winter. Um, but uh, the, uh, so the sheep farmers are basically told that they're done. We get nothing for them there. Sorry guys, um, you lose. However, um, one of the things that has been happening is a bit of a rural renaissance. Um, and they, they've actually, there's lots of um, new types of uh, innovative farming practices going on to, um, to get uh, all this milk. Um, and that's the rock for is uh, a cheese made from unpasteurized sheep's milk. Um, and so these guys um, that I'm talking about that are gonna be affected by the army base expansion are the guys that raise the sheep, that make the milk, that makes the cheese. Um, the other big product they're famous for is uh, gloves, because once sheep don't make milk anymore, that's uh, <laughs> what happens to them. Um, but uh, the uh, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of innovation happening. It's pretty vibrant. There's lots of good stuff, um, and they basically organise and say, well, we don't really want to give up our businesses, our land, our way of life. 
so that it can be blown up um, by the army because we're not really that keen on the army. Um, and it develops in a number of interesting ways. Uh, lots of pacifists get involved, lots of anti-nuclear protesters get involved. Um, it becomes a, a non-violent campaign that's formally adopted, you know, uh, really in um, after this uh, Easter fast um, by a guy called Lanza del Vasto, uh, who is a kind of um, disciple of Gandhi, uh, Shantidas, servant of peace. He's got a religious community nearby uh, called La Communité de l'Arche, uh, the Community of the Ark, as in Noah's Ark. Um, he has a fast and uh, kind of encourages the wine growers to understand the, the kind of uh, the wine growers, sorry, sheep farmers, um, to understand nonviolence and how that can uh, that can help them. Um, and there's lots of stuff that goes on like that. Um, other interesting thing for people that will relate it to things. One of the things that people are pissed off about, the reasons they don't want to see the army base expanded. First of all, because they don't want to be chucked out of their homes, their businesses, all the rest of it. Second of all, because they fear that it's going to be used to test like new weapons. So like nuclear bombs, maybe, or chemical weapons. And this is the kind of the rumors that percolate through things. But the other reason is because it's not actually a base that's used all the time by the French army. So much so that they actually rent it out um, to different countries. And so one of the big things that happens in the Larzac, and one of the reasons it gets involved with minority nationalism, is that it's rented out to the British army. And the soldiers that are involved in Bloody Sunday um, are kind of notionally trained. Um, they do exercises in the Larzac before that. Um, you know, people are serving uh, in, the in the British Army, doing training at the Larzac Army base in France, and then being shipped into Northern Ireland um, to, uh, to, to fight, basically, and to kind of police, as it were. Um, but then that's part of it because again you've got the south of france that occitan identity i mentioned and all the rest of it you've got people that say one of the slogans that emerges is this idea um the occitan movement's called volem vuri alpes um, we want to live on the land basically there's this idea they want to live and work in their own well, leave us alone is basically the idea you know just 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 leave us alone um and part of that fits into the idea that what's happening is it's paris it's the government that's kind of like getting in at them. Um, another part is that it's tied into, you know, the exploitation of other people. And so there are lots of, you know, um, slogans that tell British soldiers to go home that are about kind of, you know, no, no frère irlandais. And actually in this poster um, behind me, right here, huh? um, there's a, uh, one of the cafes uh, in the far left of it is, you won't be able to see it. I don't know if my webcam's good enough, but it says Café d'Irlande. Um, hmm. And then you've got a Larzac bus as well and all this kind of stuff. So they see these struggles as being kind of tied into each other. And they talk about the end of empire. And they talk about all the rest of it. And this is one of the things that I get really interested in because it's all international. It's all about pacifism. Um, in 1974, they do a, what's called a third world harvest. So to resist the army, they basically occupy the land. They invite lots of people down. The simple summary of what the Larzac is, is it's like Woodstock, but more politically effective. And it lasts a decade. Um, but it kind of, uh, I just go better cheese, um, but it's, uh, it kicks off and it, you know, um, in 1974, so as you can tell a few years into this, they organised this big um, event, music event, uh, speakers, all the rest called the Third World Harvest. And essentially they've grown all this wheat on the land, um, which they have a, an illegal harvest um, of this wheat. They sell it all and then they use the funds um, to donate to drought relief in the Sahel. Um, at the time, they have loads of people come down that are kind of undocumented workers, kind of uh, representatives. They have trade unions that represent kind of African workers. Uh, they have um, uh, North African um, kind of liaisons with the FLN and stuff like that. They have loads of different kind of people involved that are tied into these like anti-colonial struggles. And they strongly identify with that. Now, the interesting thing is they don't just like send the money off. There's actually two peasants of the Larzac they get on a plane with a sack of cash and actually go to the Sahel and start kind of sorting this out and working themselves. So it's an interesting kind of idea. It's not just a sort of um, a simple exercise and kind of empty slogan eating, drawing these connections. They have kind of representatives of different um, minority communities in France come, take part in it, shape the discussion, speak. You know, the idea is that... Um, the what's called uh, third world harvest opens with the kind of 
Muslim call to prayer. Um, it becomes this like idea of how to 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 live differently, as that slogan says there, of understanding a different approach to life, which allows people to have their own relationship with the land um, and be a lot more open to this. So it's it's pacifist, it's non-violent. Distinction there being, I mean, it's pacifist, doesn't it? It's anti-military, um, and they encourage people to draft dodge and all the rest of it. It's non-violent, so they do sit-ins, they do fasts, they do um, like weird protests. Um, I can tell you about more about sheep protests and a little bit of your interests um, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, I think it's fascinating and it's, you know, it's international. Um, I've spoken to people that organize protests in London. Um, I've spoken to people that organize protests in New York on Fifth Avenue um, about this. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an international phenomenon that takes off. And the best point is, spoilers, 1981, they win. Um, so that's a good thing. Yeah, people power. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying the thread through much of this conversation about um, regional yet international conversation, I guess. Um, mm. And if it's all right to move to, towards the kind of final question I might pitch to you around, um, around your research. And I'll make it a long one so you can have a good few snacks. Um, but it's some, all, um, sort of about some, the snacks. I'm, sorry. I'm just enjoying some rock for and some yeah, saucy right. sack, um, so. <laughs> It's sort of about those snacks, I suppose. And mm. um, we've had a thread in these videos around um, around books. And one of the tensions in, in book history and book studies is whether you're interested in books as an object, irrespective of what's in them. You're interested in the makers of the books and the users of the books and the size of the books, but you're not necessarily interested in the text. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other kinds of book historians who are really interested in the text as well. And I guess, yeah, where, where do you sit? Where does your work sit just in terms of, in a, a minute ago you used the phrase better cheese. Um, how invested is your work or are you as um, either professional or personally in in the deliciousness of the things that you work on? How, do, do they impact the work at all? Uh, well, so one of the things I, I spoke to someone recently um, who was talking about the fact that I've like, tended to choose research topics relatively well in terms of like how one can yeah. experience them. You know, I could be studying like racism in Lille or something like that, you know, but uh, <laughs> instead I'm studying um, uh, wine in, uh, in a wonderful place uh, or cheese in a wonderful place. Um, and that I think is, is important. You've got to be interested. You've got to have uh, a hook. I kind of got into all this. Um, I mentioned interest in subnational identities and stuff. Um, actually, as an undergrad, um, when I was writing my dissertation, I had... I, I did a qualification in wine um, when I was at high school. Uh, my dad worked in wine. Um, he was a, he wasn't a wine guy, he was a salesman. Um, he used to work for uh, Rothmans and Dunhill um, and he kind of got out the cigarette sales game uh, when it was, um, uh, <laughs> when the going was good and he got into booze. Um, so he was working basically as a, a, a wine merchant. And um, he, uh, yeah, he said, you know, I was in my fifth year at high school, and he said, what are you, you going to do this summer? You know, normal things, play football, computer games, mess about in the street with my mates. Um, and so instead I went and did uh, HNC, I think, in uh, Wines and Spirits. Mm. Um, and uh, it was great. And one of the things it did was it gave me a lot of wine education, which I didn't have before. Um, it uh, gave me expensive tastes, which I uh, still can't really satisfy in any particular way. Um, but it also kind of got me interested in the world of wine, um, and in particular about the ways that wine is made, and to think about it as a, not just a product to enjoy, but you know, as something which is people are involved in at every stage of, um, and something which people talk about lyrically um, and conveys emotion and all the rest of it. I talked to you a little bit before about uh, the guy that wrote that. Um, uh, the guy that made your wine. I was talking to you just before about the about his book, um, which includes at the end um, some uh, discussion of uh, quantum wine. Um, apparently, um, I, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I think this is like pseudoscience, but anyway, um, it's uh, it conveys something, even if not by quantum resonance. It, it, it's evocative, you know, and that's what got me interested. In it. So, as an undergrad, choosing my dissertation, I was interested in looking at the wines I liked uh, from the region I liked, which is this kind of stuff, uh, and I wanted to see where that went. Um, since then, I've done, you know, I've worked in a lot of wine shops. Um, I've uh, been involved in the, the kind of wine trade. It was my, um, I reached a point at undergrad where I had a choice between, uh, I had an offer to essentially manage a wine shop or to pursue an academic career. And I'm still, I'm still kind of like, you know, uh, I'm still not certain that I, I chose wisely. But we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Um, See what happens at the end of the day. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm interested, I'm invested in those ideas. Um, 
I'll be honest, my work is not so much about necessarily the kind of the, uh, the emotional kind of um, enjoyment of the consumption of the product. I've always been less interested in studying the consumption of products that, of wine and cheese than actually engaging in the consumption of wine and cheese. Um, I quite like studying the production of them as well because then I can enjoy that while I'm consuming it. Um, so I think my, my thing has not been always about kind of writing lyrically about what, what wine is as it were, but about how it came to be and what actually is involved in those processes as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. And you tantalizingly talked about sheep protests earlier as well. So I must make sure I ask you to unpack that for us before we, we head towards the close. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've done um, I've done some work on the idea of sheep as a protest object. Um, and what I mean by that is the idea that basically one of the things they have in the laws, like it's absolutely wonderful, is this idea that um, the police in France, especially the kind of the riot police, the CRS, um, are pretty violent. Like they're pretty handy, if you know what I mean. They don't mind mixing up in protests. Uh, they come, like, they've got black helmets on, all the rest of it, you know. Um, and these protesters quickly realise that whilst the CRS are, are very well versed in how to uh, disperse protests, the one thing they have lots of that the CRS are not very good at dispersing is livestock um and so they use sheep as a form of uh like to kind of bolster the protest because one of the things you can do is release a ton of sheep um and the police can't really do much about it because you know the, the police they're not trained to <laughs> to herd animals um so you know the last act protesters do some some very uh visible things like they take a bunch of sheep um in a truck all the way from the aviron all the way up like the country to paris and they let those sheep out to graze under the Eiffel Tower um, so that people can take photos and enjoy and kind of see what's happening. Um, one of the other things to do in 1977 that I've been writing a bit about um, at the minute is, is this wonderful thing where a couple of the, uh, the Marzac farmers, this group, the, the overall group is called the 103 because there's 103 families, um, uh, they're put on trial um, and they're put on trial in the town of Mio, um, which is a beautiful place, um, but they're in the courtroom and the judge is you know, laying down his sentence and all the rest of it. And it's not a big town, and it's right on the, um, the large like step, uh, and two, two uh, livestock trucks come in at either side and block off the street. They then release about, I think it's 70 odd uh, sheep. Um, the farmers rush up to the, uh, to the courtroom. You have the, the policemen essentially trying to pull the doors shut while all these guys are holding the doors, keeping them open. They run a huge banner right across the front of the courtroom to block all the windows. It says Larzac Insoumise, unbowed. Um, that kind of the first step of it. While they hold the doors open, they usher all these sheep in the door into the courtroom. And some wonderful pictures uh, in the archives of what happens next. So apparently all the sheep pour into the courtroom. You can imagine, you've got your kind of courtroom with your judge, you've got your kind of all the rest of it, uh, people on, uh, in the stands and all the rest, and you have a, a, you know, about 70 odd sheep suddenly rush into the room. Um, some of the reporters uh, quite gleefully say that they kind of uh, immediately run up to say hello to the judge. Um, but there's a wonderful picture, um, it's a drawing, so there's no uh, cameras in the courtroom, but uh, it, uh, it captures one of the unintended intended side effects, because if you have 70 odd sheep in any indoor space, um, they don't smell very sweet and they are quite productive in terms of their backsides. Um, and so <laughs> this idea that suddenly you've got a courtroom filled with the chaos and noise of all these wild animals. And of course the trial is abandoned. Um, and it becomes just a wonderful way of seeing how these, these animals become like, a key part of the protest. And it's all non-violent, you know, um, but it makes its point. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's pretty effective. That's what it yeah. looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, just before going into lockdown, Andrew, um, my partner and I were thinking about getting a sheepdog puppy. And unfortunately oh. lockdown stop that from happening but I'm feeling quite happy that she's not here right now because she'd be horrified by this conversation <laughs> uh, as we discussed releasing a ton of sheep into, yeah. uh, into the courtroom. <laughs> Instincts, <laughs> instinct. <laughs> um, we're ending our videos by asking um, the question of uh, whether the word literature is a word which is um, uh, important to you, useful to you, unhelpful to you um, professionally or personally but whether it's a word that kind of sits in your in your vocabulary. Um, mm. Mind telling us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I can definitely say that I'm not a literature scholar. Um, you know, I'm not somebody that uh, that delves into, um, I guess, the kind of the poesy and the kind of um, significance and all the rest of it of individual phrases and kind of dissects a piece of text and the, it's kind of um, the merits to which it speaks. I'm definitely someone that looks more at the ways in which um, things are created into processes um, than actual kind of uh, kind of critical engagement with the kind of the finished article itself. 
And in that, I kind of guess, like, when I use the word literature, when I see the word literature used, um, it tends to say to me the idea of the canon. Um, and I think that that really is something that I often see, you know, when I talk about, I think I mentioned earlier on, I talked about um, having, you know, engaging with the literature. And for me, it always has a sense of something that is canonical, um, that refers to the things that I ought to be reading. Um, it's not the, the dreadful trashy sci-fi that I read before bed, but the books that make me think and therefore I don't read at bedtime. Um, you know, the things that, you know, it, it, for me, I guess it speaks to something that is canonical, um, but also there's a kind of, um, you know, a, a kind of quality mark it tends to suggest to me as well. We talk about literary fiction and so on. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that's what it conveys to me. Something that's canonical and I guess kind of related to quality as well. Um, something which engages maybe more with the idea of the text as an object rather than the text as a process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not a totally dissimilar a, a dissimilar answer to the answer you gave about wine and cheese, actually. It's kind of interesting. Uh, mm. Yeah, thank you. Andrew, I've learned so much. I can't quite believe the journey you've taken us from the 12th century all the way <laughs> to um, the present. Um, we've had unexpected lice as well as sheep in the, I was going to say the baggage area, but in the court area. <laughs> um, uh, and I've learned absolute, um, absolute tons. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Cheers, Andy. And uh, Santé. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm nearly out. Cheers. <laughs>